Welcome to the Bold Lounge Podcast. My name is Lee Burgess, and I will be your host. If you're anything like me, you love hearing inspiring stories of people who have gone on bold journeys and made a positive impact in the world. This podcast is all about those kinds of stories. Every week, we'll hear from someone who has taken a leap or embarked on an extraordinary journey. In addition to hearing their stories, we'll also learn about their bold growth mindset that they use to make things happen. Whether they face challenges or doubts along the way, they persisted and ultimately achieved their goals. These impactful stories will leave you feeling motivated and inspired to pursue your own bold journey. I believe everyone has a bold story waiting to be freed. Tune in and get ready to be inspired. Welcome to the Bold Lounge. Today I have Dr. Melissa Sunderman. She is a double board certified physician in internal medicine and lifestyle medicine and has been practicing for over 20 years. She also has training in integrative medicine through the University of Michigan and has completed a professional training program in mind body medicine through the Center of Mind Body Medicine based in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much, Lee. I am so happy to be here today. So we're going to jump into being bold, and I would love to hear your definition of bold. All right. So when I think of bold, you know, I automatically go to when I'm like writing an email and something I want to highlight, right? And I Mm -hmm. make, I bold it so it stands out. And when I think of being bold, I think of standing out to myself, like for myself. And that means showing up authentically and unapologetically. And it's really putting myself out to the world and out to my world. And what I've learned about showing up authentically, unapologetically, is it requires vulnerability and it requires getting out of your comfort zone. And it requires self-acceptance and self-compassion and self-love. And so I think that's really what bold means to me. That's an excellent definition. Some of those pieces are hard to do. Yeah. I'll just say from my own experience, maybe everyone listening thinks, oh, that's a piece of cake, but I doubt it. Yeah. Because, oh. <laughs> I'm you know, not saying it's easy at all. Yeah. Yeah. Being bold isn't easy. I think yeah. that's something that people learn along the way, or they learn the continuum of boldness. You can be bold in a quiet way. You don't have to shout about it. But I think some of the things that you talked about by being authentically yourself, which we see a lot and, you know, having self-compassion, having self-love, those things, I don't know, in my experience, they they get better over time. You shine a light on them differently, maybe in your 20s versus your 30s versus your 40s versus your 50s and so on. So speaking of this great definition, what's a memorable moment of boldness for you? So I think one of my first memories, I didn't know I was being bold at the time, but I look back and I, we're not on camera, but I'm not a very big person. I'm like maybe five, two on a good day, but now I'm in my fifties. So I don't even want to measure myself. I'm sure. I'm sure I um, and you just made me sit up taller. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I'll do that too. Um, but I, during elementary school, I was on a swim team and one uh, season, they set goals for us, and we had goals in the freestyle and the backstroke and the butterfly. And I was able to get my goals, and but I had a goal for butterfly. And being a petite person, butterfly was not my strength. And I just remember thinking to myself, fourth, third, or fourth grade, like, oh, I'm going to get this goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it was not hard, and I was really strategic. And I remember my best friend was a really good butterflyer. So I would have her practice next to me and I'd try to chase her. And eventually after like months of doing this, I finally, you know, was able to get my goal of this 50 yard butterfly, you know, age eight or nine. And what that meant was I actually got a really nice sweat jacket. Um, that, nice. but it, it was like the, my first memory of being like, Oh, there's a lot of odds against this because I'm just physically not very good at this, but I'm going to be bold and just believe in myself that I I can achieve this goal. So that, that was a very early memory of being bold without really knowing it. And I, I think you're absolutely right that coming into whatever our definition of boldness is, 
comes with life experience too. And living through life and certain chapters of our life that we think, wow, I would have maybe not written that chapter this way, but it is life and you learn yeah. from it, you come out the other side and you learn the power of vulnerability and, and how to be true to yourself and show, just showing up. And so it's really allowed me and it propelled me to, you know, put myself out there knowing that I could fail, but, but putting myself out there. And I think that as we get into more of the conversation of how I pursued my passion as in lifestyle medicine and what I truly believe about goes into wellness and healing and my passion for the outdoors and some of these things that I just feel so strongly deep, this deep connection that I want to share with others and allow that to come out of me and be brave enough to show that. I think that's where I'm continuing to learn how to be bold about that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think what I think about integrative medicine and boldness, I think being in integrative medicine and wellness is bold in itself. Going back to when I was at Duke, we created the integrative center and it was a big deal and it's a beautiful building. And it's still actually where I go to get my acupuncture. I remember it being bold because it's not something immediately that makes money. It's not something that immediately you can look at a, you know, in anyone in healthcare or in any business, everyone looks at a service line or looks at something and says, you know, how much profit can we make? What are, you know, what are the the trade-offs? Not everything makes money in healthcare, of course. Uh, but when you're building something, you want to make sure you have a business plan for it. But out of the gate, it wasn't something that did that. And I remember just feeling like, wow, we're being very bold by creating this center, by doing these things, by putting this type of medicine. And we're talking early 2000s, 23 years ago. Like It wasn't the cool thing that it may be now. And even now, people are still trying to figure out how to do this. Now, you work at Canyon Ranch, which I think is is someone who's also been in the forefront of this. It's definitely been part of their ethos of how they operate, right? Absolutely. And I think that um, Mel Zuckerman, the founder of Canyon Ranch, you know, 30, 40 years ago, just had this vision that wellness is not just one part, right? There's many facets, many parts to wellness. And he had this concept of let's put this essentially under one roof where mm-hmm. we can have integrated care. And we know that wellness is not just, I mean, there's big parts, components of food you put into your body or how you move your body or how, um, what's your self-compassion, what's your spiritual beliefs, what, what's your mental health. All these things are really important. And I always describe this or think about this as spokes on a wheel and like riding a bike. And I'm a big bike rider. And if you break one of those spokes, it's not a good thing. Your your wheel will not revolve as properly. So all of these lifestyle components really not only play off of each other, but are all equally important. I think that's what Mel Zuckerman really visioned uh, very very long ago. And so at Canyon Ranch, I feel like we do an excellent job at taking care of the whole person. Yeah. Another important point you said is, you know, when you were swimming and doing the butterflies, like you didn't think about being bold. And I think that is the thing that I don't, if people believe this or not, but I didn't go around saying I'm bold, I'm bold, I'm bold. Obviously I'm talking about it a lot now, but in my life until 48, I wasn't really amplifying that. I was that, no doubt. Yeah. But I didn't walk into a room and go, I'm bold. And I think what's interesting about that is sometimes you're being bold and you don't even know it, right? So you're taking a chance, you're learning, you're, you might fail when you come out of it. I mean, your example of the butterfly, it took a while, you know, to like get to the point where you felt you were actually mastering it or able to do it well. And that's bold. Another example of that is, you know, my path very early on, even going, considering going into medicine, there was not a single family member, we're talking parents, aunts, uncles, cousins that was in the medical field, mm-hmm. you know, nursing, doctors. And, you know, at an early age, I said, I, I think I could be a doctor, you know, and just had this, this calling, as we'll say, but just this yeah. curiosity and this interest. And again, didn't come from any um, healthcare professionals um, within my family. And this was back uh, in the in the eighties when women in science, this is far, you know, before STEM and all these yeah. um, programs. And I went to the university of Michigan for undergrad in 1988 and they had a brand new program um, called women in science. And so freshman year, I thought, well, this sounds kind of interesting. 
I was in the very first cohort. I think it was 10 of us where they assigned us to labs and I worked doing research on uh, tissue culture and just was really exposed to to science. And now we know that, you know, when you look at medical school classes, about half of them are females, which is wonderful. But back then, you know, we just didn't have that representation. And so right. thank goodness for me, you know, and I had in middle school and high school, I had science teachers that I'd be one of the only females in the class that they really encouraged me. They're like, you're good at this. You can do this. You know, if your dream is to go to medical school, you've got the tools. And again, like not realizing this was being bold by being a minority that was, you know, really wanting to pursue this, not having a background in it, not having a family member that could guide me and uh, just saying, this is, this is my mission and this is my calling and I'm going to do what I can do to prepare myself for that. And, and truth be told, I didn't get into med school the first time I tried. And so I tried again. And so Mm -hmm. when people, you know, say, gosh, you know, I interviewed for a job and they didn't get it. I'm like, okay. You know, what'd you learn from that? Try again. And I think that, you know, being bold is continuing to, to show up. Yeah. Sometimes when we kind of go through that process of learning, working towards our calling, you know, before we recorded, we were talking a little about, you know, what did you think you were going to be in ninth grade? You know, I thought I was going to, I had two things. I was either going to be a CEO of a children's hospital or I was going to be a cardiac surgeon at Duke. Like I had Duke, even though I'm a big UNC Tar Heels fan, I wanted to go to school at Duke. And I ended up being neither of those. So (laughs) what we think we were going to be or what we want to be sometimes evolves, right? Or we like stick with it. Like it sounded like you knew what you wanted to be and you stuck at it and it wasn't easy, right? So again, we go back to butterfly to med school, obviously not the same level of of rigor, but there are probably things that you can extrapolate of what you did when you were 10 versus to what you do when you're 18, 19, 20, 22. In a sense of like, what are your learnings around going after something in the first or second pass? And you're also an ultra marathoner. So like just last weekend, you did a 50K. Everything doesn't come easy on in, in any spectrum of that. So what's the process that you go through in the sense of like, when something doesn't work on the first pass, what goes through your mind uh, from a bold mindset perspective? Yeah, I think it's sort of the analysis of, okay, maybe that didn't go the way I wanted it to. And then also taking a look at perhaps, you know, this wasn't really the path for me. So mm-hmm. there's, I think there's a difference between giving up. I don't want to give up, right, unnecessarily, but also saying, okay, I gave it a try and maybe there's a different pathway for me and to not take things personally Mm -hmm. um, because there's been, you know, jobs I've interviewed that I I didn't get. And so just saying, okay, did I give it, did I show up as my best self and did I, was I prepared and I gave it my all? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of parallels, as you mentioned, I've done endurance running and triathlons and things like that. And I think there's so many parallels on what happens as I go through like a running race. Yeah. And, let me, let, let me and, just insert a few things because you're being yeah. very modest and humble. <laughs> You've run the Boston Marathon 10 times. You have run a full Ironman try three times. So when she's talking about her races and the things she does, not just that phenomenal 50K, which was probably like a 5K to, to normal people, you know, you do a 50K on a weekend, you have really honed what I would call athleticism, being able to in some way, be in control of your mind and body as you do something physically. So I just want to make sure that people understand what you've done and how much you have honed this craft. Yeah. And I think that, again, this sort of evolved organically. Like I I told you that I I swam, I dabbled in swimming, (laughs) but really I was a ballet dancer really growing up all through middle school, high school, college. So taking up running and and biking and, and these kind of things was something I just kind of experimented with and had fun along the way. And even to this day, when I do an event or a long run, whatever that case may be, there's usually a point that I think this is getting too hard. Mm-hmm. Like, I think I need to to stop. I need to slow down. I don't know if I can do this. And there's that little voice, you know, that says, just try to get to the next station. Just try mm-hmm. to get to the next mile marker. Just uh, sometimes I listen to song, you know, to music on my headphones, try to get through, you know, two more songs. And so it's really balancing, you know, are these just my body telling me something? Is my mind telling me what are these, these narratives that I'm hearing? And, you know, 
what can I do sometimes to just say, no, you're, you're okay. This is mm-hmm. uncomfortable right now. You're out of your comfort zone. You're in your challenge zone. But a lot of times, as we know, it's that challenge zone that really makes a difference and, and propels us to keep moving forward and learning and, you know, achieving something. And obviously, if I'm got something going on that, you know, I'm injured or, or something like that, I'm not going to push my body to the point of having some detrimental consequence. But a lot of times in life, you know, you got to put yourself out there and really put yourself into that challenge zone of like, I don't know how this is going to turn out or I'm going to show up and, you know, and so I think that every time I, I run a race like that and I always have this conversation, oh, if I stop right now, my family will still love me. My kids will still love me. It's okay. I'll come home and my dogs will kiss me and hug me. We've both got Bernese Mountain Dogs and they will be all lovey-dovey with me. So I have that conversation and then somehow something says, you can do this. Yeah. Believe it. Believe in yourself. Keep moving forward. You know, just, you don't have to think about the finish line. You know, it's there, but just keep moving forward. And I think that, you know, in life we, we have finish lines there's a goal, but I always say that the finish line is not the end, right? It's just can be the start of something, something new. So yeah. uh, I just try to keep those metaphors moving forward, no matter if it's related to my profession, whether it's, you know, raising a family, whether it's out on the running course, um, just all avenues of life. Yeah. Important pieces in there of this moving forward, right? Not staying in the same place, not stagnating. Sometimes when we try hard to do some things, we think, oh, if I quit, it'll be bad. It will have a negative consequence. And pushing through it is a good thing. There's also a time in our lives where it's almost, I'll just use my example, like I'm banging my head against a wall. Like, why am I continuing to do something that really isn't meant for me? Isn't, and I don't, I'm talking about health. I'm talking about whether it's a job or specific thing I think I wanted, but it's not coming. Sometimes you got to get the message. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes, there are these moments and it's hard sometimes like, does this mean I shouldn't try harder? Or does this, you know, sometimes we're kind of going back and forth. It was like, well, I didn't get that job. Does that mean I should try again? Or does that mean I should maybe try something new? We have to go through that process of figuring out, is it a continue on or is it like, let's reflect and maybe pivot. But I think going forward, believing in yourself, realizing that, yes, you have a goal, you have an end goal, but the next step to that goal is what you have to work on first. Right. And there's a mindset of an ultra marathoner that I just think is fascinating. So like reading David Goggins and mm-hmm. you know, hearing some, I mean, he's extreme. Talk about bull. Yeah. Yes, he is uh, extreme. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone doesn't know, look him up and you'll just be in awe of like what this guy does and is all about and has a way of going at it. And I think everyone can come into that, but there is this sense of, you know, wanting to do something more, wanting to get to that next level, wanting to take care of yourself and be healthy. And obviously you find a lot of joy in it too. Yeah. And like you mentioned this, this 50 kilometer um, trail race that I did this past weekend back in Michigan. So it was roughly, roughly 31.89 miles to be exact. Um, I, that's what my government said. Just, just roughly. Just roughly. <laughs> and, and it is like a, again, I'm going to come back to my running metaphors of you know it's going to be a long day and mm. and there's a lot of uncertainty. So you don't know what the weather is going to be like. You don't know what the course is going to be like. You don't know what your body's going to do. You don't know how nutrition is going to sit in your gut. Like, are you going to have GI? And so you literally have to continue to reassess. Like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to start off. And also I'm going to start off. I don't have to think about finishing right now. So I start off nice and slow. I stay within myself my ability, and I'm constantly checking it, right? And I think anything that we're doing of continuing to move forward, you know, I always say 1% better and moving towards a goal is that we're always checking in being like, am I okay? Am I, did I go out too fast because I wanted to be like other people, you know? And so, no, 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 come back to myself. Like this adventure is about, you know, what I want to do with it and not concern myself with everyone else. I mean, you should write a book, the comparisons between the mindset of a runner or ultra marathoner. I mean, one of the things you just said, which I think happens and is extrapolated into the world we live in daily is comparison. Yes. Like I'm comparing myself to that person or to that person or to that person. And what happens is you, you get out of yourself then you're like so much paying attention to everything outside that you're not able to do that check-in that you just talked about, which is so, so important. And yes. it's natural. Like it happens to the best of us. I'm not saying that I don't 
don't every now and then go, hmm, I think I should be at that level, but I'm not. But then I very quickly, I think that's the thing as I get older, like I get back in much quicker than I did before. Right. Yes. And yeah. or, I, or I get focused on what I think I, I hope is the right thing, the next goalpost, you know, so it's not. I'm so far away from what I'm really supposed to be focusing on. But that's really important is that comparison. Yeah, for this 50K, not that I was doubting myself, but I'm 53 and I'm I'm not getting any faster, let's be honest. But when I started off this, I knew it was going to be a long day out there. I started off really conservative. I ended up, you meet people along the way. So I ended up running with these two wonderful women. They were in their 30s. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh, that's great that they're, you know, keeping me company. And I really, you know, we ran together for about half the race. So I got to know them a lot. Then at a certain point, one of them started having some GI issues. Another one just started slowing down. And I just said, well, I feel pretty good. I'm just going to keep moving forward. And, you know, part of my mind was like, oh, I'm in my fifties and okay. And I got to the last aid station and um, with altars, like you just check in because they want to make sure that you didn't get lost out there in the wilderness, right? They want to make sure, okay, we got it. So when I gave my race number, and this was about five miles to go, she said, you're the first female. And I said, oh, haha, you mean the first old lady female, right? In my age group, the 50 to 55. And she said, no, you're the first overall female. And I thought, my goodness, <laughs> this is not <laughs> what I was expecting. And I said, well, then I better go. I, I better keep moving forward. Yeah. And so I ended up winning and just really surprised myself. But I think that whole strategy of not comparing, just staying within myself, continuing to evaluate, being smart, not overdoing it. But also, you know, when they told me, hey, you're winning this thing, I was like, well, then I'm going to finish this I'm thing. Gonna win this <laughs> I'm going to yeah. win this thing. So it's, you know, I think that we, we learn those lessons just in the, the least expected places sometimes. And um, yeah, so maybe I will write that book because there are so many yeah, parallels. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely think of it. And there's like, there's great examples right there. You under compared in this sense yeah. of like, you didn't realize how great you were doing. So it's important for people to remember that, but how you can avoid that is just staying within yourself, running your own race right. and not anybody else's. So one of the things that you've done in your career is also help physicians with the world that they have to live in. Can you tell me a little bit about the Revive program and what that is all about and how it came about? Absolutely. A little bit over a year ago, I met with another physician, uh, Dr. Robin Tiger. Some people of your listeners may be familiar with her. She's mm-hmm. stress- We've seen her on LinkedIn. Yeah, the stress-free MD. We both have been um, doctors for a long time, 25, 30 years. Robin came from radiology and okay. I'm uh, board certified in, in internal medicine. And then we both became board certified in lifestyle medicine. And so we're board certified through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine where we acknowledge and understand through evidence that our lifestyle behaviors are so intricately tied to our health and well-being. So that's food is medicine, movement is medicine, sleep is medicine, avoidance of risky substances, stress management, social connection. And then I also wear the hat of Dr. Outdoors. Um, so nature mm-hmm. is medicine. And so these seven pillars of health are really so important. And as lifestyle medicine, we look to, to boost individuals' overall health and well-being by utilizing these pillars. And we came together and Robin had the great idea because she's been doing physician well-being coaching and really helping fellow physicians of let's combine our hats and let's put together a program called Revive. And Revive is all about group coaching for physicians in order to elevate their well-being. And people would think that as physicians, because we know how to take care of others, we know how to take care of ourselves. And we really don't. We're not Mm -hmm. taught this in medical school. And Robin and I learned this becoming board certified in lifestyle medicine. And and I think that when you are a lifestyle medicine physician, uh, just like if you're an integrative medicine, a lot of times you need to practice what you preach Mm -hmm. in order to live this life. And so we created a program. We did our uh, first cohort in the spring. We had physicians of all different kinds of specialties and uh, different uh, times in practice. Some people were fairly new to being in practice of medicine. Some were retired. And what we found was that physicians 
you know, really are struggling. We know that when we look at burnout, when we look at resiliency and all these catchphrases is that people are leaving the profession. I know that's, that's coming across a lot of people leaving their profession, but I think that we're really seeing this in medicine like we haven't before. And so our program was 10 weeks and we met virtually and we did both. We felt it was very important not to just talk to individuals about the what and why, like how should you eat better? Like, or why should you eat better? And, and what's the evidence, but also how. So we had both didactic sessions and then experiential. So for nutrition, we actually talked about what good nutrition looks like in the didactic portion. And then on the experiential, we actually had our physicians go to their cupboards, take things out of the refrigerator, the cupboards. And we talked about how to read food labels, something that, you know, they didn't know how to do. And then for, you know, stress, Robin and all of her training with yoga and mindfulness was able to go through experiential about how to do self-care as far as stress management. And as Dr. Outdoors, we talked about nature. We actually did a, a grounding technique, a Shinran Yoku, when we went outside. So not only did we focus on the what and why, we also gave the tools about how with experiential. Mm-hmm. And we collected data pre and post and our physicians did amazing. And so there was tangible things like they lost weight. Some people who really wanted to focus on cutting down alcohol or caffeine were able to do that. Some people who hadn't been exercising started to exercise. Individuals that were more socially isolated started spending more time with friends and family. People felt more present at work. They felt like they could be, they were better around their family. They had more patience. So we had really, really good outcomes. And it really was just learning about self-care. I mean, we're trained is, you know, our patients come first and we wanted, you know, to really make them understand you can't take care of others if you aren't showing up as your best self. And so how to come back to that and tools to be able to do that. So uh, yes, it's called Revive and we are currently getting ready for our next cohort and I'm really excited about what we've been able to see the transformations. Yeah. A couple of things you said in there of, you know, I think sometimes we underestimate what we know or what we don't know. And I think these are people who take care of other people who have their lives in their hands in the sense of like what they're responsible for. But like you said, they may not put themselves first, right? That they, they may actually be the last on the list. What's the one thing that, you know, someone who is not a physician What don't we understand about a physician's life? Just educate us a little bit here. You know, I think from our training from day one is the devotion, Mm -hmm. right? And with that devotion comes this passion, right? That it is part of you. You, you know, become a healer. And the way that we are trained, especially when I was in training in the late 80s, early 90s, is you had to make a lot of sacrifices, right? And I ended up having my two kids during residency. So fortunately, I was able to take six weeks off. But the very first day I came back, you know, after six weeks off, I was put on a 36 hour call. And so you really have to learn how to balance that. And I did my best to balance being a physician and a mom and a wife and a daughter. And there was times that... (laughs) it was not easy. And I was in tears and, you know, things that would be where I felt like I wasn't showing up enough as a mother. I wasn't showing up enough as a physician. And so really they, you know, that all professions, but certainly when you're taking care of people's lives, it's a lot of responsibility. And sometimes it's really hard to create healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think when, if you talk to physicians, we all have cases, we'll say that just, you know, like maybe outcomes that were not ideal or situations that you really, I mean, just shakes you to the core Mm -hmm. of loss and you're responsible for lives. You're responsible for people's sons and daughters and aunts and uncles and parents and, you know, children. And it's a lot of responsibility, but with that responsibility comes so much joy and so much, you know, privilege like that I've been able to impact others' lives. So I think that, and I don't want to single out just physicians because I think so many professions, people are so passionate about what they do, but it truly to my core is, is being a healer, but it, it is a lot of responsibility and it, you know, it always is. And, and I've taken that oath and hit the credit oath to really care for others and do my best that I can each and every day. 
Yeah. Well, I think it's a next level of responsibility. I mean, I'm sure people listening talk about devotion and passion and sacrifices and it not being easy and trying to find alignment or balance and, you know, realizing boundaries get stretched in any industry. Right. But I think there's a degree of that. And I think, you know, in many people, look, no one's going to die if we make this decision. Well, that's not the case when it comes to a physician, right? So I think, you know, even as an administrator in healthcare, in operations, I was like, I just want to make sure that what I do makes a difference in the lives of other people, whether we get something done faster or more efficiently or a higher level of quality or better outcome. Like we can all connect into what you just talked about, but it is an elevated, and I want to just acknowledge the elevated responsibility of an MD. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. One of the things that I think I've heard, and I don't know if you've heard this at Canyon Ranch and the things that you've done with Revive, but I know what to do, but I'm not doing it. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone? And I'm one of those people, you know, around their health. Let's just hone into health. I know what to do. I know I need to eat. I need to move. I need to, you know, go to the LinkedIn and you get bossed around quite a bit. You'll know what. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Behavior change is really difficult, right? That's why 80 to 90% of New Year's resolutions do not last. Right. We were just talking about that. Yeah. So when I think when you look at behavior change with our physicians, one of the things we would do with each pillar that we were going through each week is that we would work with them to create, okay, a goal for behavior change within Mm -hmm. that pillar. And we utilized level of confidence. Okay. And we always emphasized 1% better. Because I think so often with behavior change, you're like, I need to lose 20 pounds yesterday. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to run a 5k yesterday. I am going to sleep at least seven hours yesterday. And so we are in this culture of we want quick fixes, right? And so often those quick fixes are not sustainable. So as a lifestyle medicine physician, my whole platform is we want to create sustainable lifestyle behaviors. Mm -hmm. This is not a diet. This is not you're doing P90X for the next three months and then you're done once you finish the program. This is not oh, I'm doing a sleep challenge with my friends. And then after that, I'm going to go back to my my old ways of crappy sleep habit. This is about creating sustainable change. And so in order to do that, some tools that we use is addressing, like if you want to make a change of like, you know what, I don't like vegetables, but I'm going to try to have one vegetable a day, mm-hmm. right? And then I say, okay, so Lee, what, what's your, how confident are you on? Zero to like, no way, can I do that? 10, Absolutely. And you're like, well, probably about a five. And I say, well, okay, then we probably shouldn't have you make that goal. Because really, we know that level of confidence, unless you're at a seven, it it may not be successful. So how about you say, I'm going to have a vegetable every other day. You're like, oh, I'm an eight. Yeah, I'm an eight. Okay, then let's make that your goal. And then going to, you know, creating a SMART goal. So being specific, Mm -hmm. being measurable, being attainable, being relevant in time. So, okay. What kind of vegetable do you have? Well, um, I think on Mondays, I'm going to try broccoli. Well, what meal are you going to have it? Oh, God. Think about that. Yeah, you need to think about that. Um, I'm going to put it in my salad at lunch. Okay, that sounds great. And you're going to do that how many times a week? Well, I'm going to try doing that twice a week. So all of these things that we can set up beforehand, because behavior change, some people just can flip a dime and do it. But a lot of us, the majority of us, really have to be thoughtful about this. and there is no right or wrong way, but we want to help set up behavior change for success, mm-hmm. right? And the more planning and forethought we can do for that, and just again saying that quick fixes oftentimes don't last. A lot of times, my patients they will emphasize one percent better, and then I actually draw two ladders, and one ladder has rungs to climb, like every you know six inches, and then. And it gets to, you know, the top of the building. And then the ladder standing next to it has rungs about every like five feet and still gets to the top of the building. And I say, which ladder do you think you want to climb? I want to climb the one that has all the the rungs. Again, yes. So baby steps moving forward or moving up the ladder is still going to get you to that same destination, but you're going to have a lot higher percentage of success along the way. So that's how we empower and educate and guide my patients too. And if you're not able, if you have a bad day or I was on vacation, I got off track, that's okay. Right. This is, it's 
cliche saying progress, not perfection, right? So in just aiming 1% better, that's all. Don't have to be 100% better. Don't have to be even 25% better, just just 1% better. Yeah. And these things will, will be additive, right? And they, they build off of each other. If you start to eat a little bit better, you're probably going to sleep a little bit better and your mood is probably going to be a, bit, a little bit better and you're going to have the energy to maybe move your body more. And so everything, you know, plays off of, of all these um, lifestyle medicine pillars do interact and play off of each other. Definitely. A couple of things in there of just the 1% better. I think if you think about your example of the rungs of the, the actual ladder, I think sometimes we're like, I want it quicker. I want it better. I want it faster. Right. So I'm going to, I look at that ladder with the big spaces in between. I'm going to do that one. And then we, we get the first one and then like the second one comes really hard and then we quit. We we stop or pause or whatever you want to call it. I call it quitting. And then you don't start back up again because man, that was, that was too hard. It's because your goal wasn't the right goal potential or your measure wasn't the right measure. So I think people hearing that it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means you maybe need to start over and do it a different way. Yeah. Right. And it has to be sustainable. And yeah, you can have your off days. I'm sure you have an off day. Everybody has an off day, but it's like, how long does it take you to get back? to where you need to be. So some great guidance, Uh, check all the things about Melissa and her work and revive and Canyon ranch in the episode notes. Thank you so much for being on the bold lounge. Thank you for having me. Lee. Thank you for listening to the bold lounge podcast through the continuum of bold stories, vulnerability to taking a leap. You will meet more extraordinary people making a positive impact for others through their unique and important story. By highlighting these stories, we hope to inspire others and share the journey of those with a bold mindset. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and look forward to sharing the next bold journey with you.